Pretty well here. How are things in Amarillo? Oh, couldn't be better. Good. It's a little bit cooler here in Longview today. Ah. Feeling nice and uh, ready to get this this study going. How about you? Oh, me too, man. We are we've warmed up to forty four degrees, so <laughs> we've wow. we, we've had quite the turnaround. Uh, but uh, nice. I am not complaining. <laughs> Dude, that would that would be nice to get some of that down here. Yeah, we were supposed to get it, and then it died out in Central Texas. And maybe by next week, we're going to be cooling down a little bit too. Oh, that'd be nice. Are we just old people who talk about the weather now? I mean, I'm okay with that because I drink more coffee now. So <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten. I don't. I don't drink coffee and I don't play golf. So I'm. I'm not there yet. Oh man, you'll grow up one day. It's okay. <laughs> so sean what are, what are we going to talk about today well let's talk about this miracle argument uh that mr newbauer made in in the reeves newbauer debate all right so for those of you who uh haven't joined with us before my name is tyler sams i'm joined by sean chancellor uh we both took part uh, as audience members in the uh, reeves newbauer discussion on the ad 70 doctrine also called um, realized eschatology or preterism. And we have been going back, watching clips from the debate and kind of breaking down the arguments presented by both debaters. And one of the topics that we're looking at in specific today is an argument introduced by Mr. Neubauer in the debate concerning miracles. And the idea, Sean, if I understood him correctly, is that uh, Mr. Neubauer pictured Mr. Reeves' position as awaiting, I think, what he called the, the greatest miracle that would ever occur, uh, awaiting a moment when Jesus would return in the clouds, would um, raise the dead, take the righteous home to heaven, confine the wicked to hell. And Mr. Neubauer said he denies that, that even such a thing could take place. Do I, I, I think have that that's exactly right? what he said. Um, and, and I think a lot of that's the, the very words that he used. So yeah, I think that was the idea. Do you happen to have a clip of him just so we can make sure? Yeah, that we've got a series right? of them. I'll tell you what, I'll play the one where he talks about the idea that we're waiting on the greatest miracle of all time. Okay, sounds good. He believes the greatest miracle of all he time could happen place any time. So did you get up? Did you looking for the so miracle? Did you get up? Did you? No, he miracle? believes in miracles. No, he believes in miracles. I all right, so he says, you know, he believes, talking about Mr. Reeves, that the greatest miracle of all time could happen at any time. And then he goes on, he says, did you get up looking for the miracle? And then he assumes we didn't, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting, uh, as if those that believe what we believe don't actually think that time could end at any moment, that the trumpet could sound, that the resurrection could occur. Uh, I happen to be fairly convicted that that is exactly right. Um, I try to live my life in a way that reflects that so that I would be prepared if that is the moment. Um, and that's what I try to preach to people that they need to do as well. So, Sean, I, I think what we have going on here, and you can correct me if, if you think I'm mistaken, I, I think we've got kind of a dog whistle effect okay. going on here, kind of yeah. a red herring, right? Um, and, and this was something I think we saw with Mr. Neubauer throughout the debate. Mr. Neubauer talked about holding hands with the Catholics uh, throughout the debate. And then here he's, he's pulling out this, this idea of, belief in a, in, a, in, a, in a miracle yet to occur, as though somehow, if one held to that view, uh, one is in with the charismatic or Pentecostal groups and, and has denied what Mr. Neubauer would argue is a fundamental tenet of uh, what? Sure. The gospel? Yeah. Well, a reality of the period right. of time in which we live. And Sean, I, I think perhaps Mr. Neubauer, I, I think perhaps his idea of a miracle is too mm. limited. Okay. I think maybe he has limited the idea of a miracle beyond what scripture intended. Uh, and, and I think, 
I think the audience was done a disservice because Mr. Neu Neubauer brought up this argument, Sean, but he never defined to the audience what he meant by Yeah, I hero. think that was a problem. And, you know, ambiguity, especially in a debate, is a dangerous thing. Um, and, you know, you and I talked about this yesterday. The term miracle may not be the easiest term to define. And, and so if we're going to use Absolutely that term, not. I think we need to tell people what we mean by it. All right, so Sean, when you and I are using the term miracle, what are we meaning by it? Maybe we need to make sure we're not guilty of, of mistakes that we're pointing out in others. You use that word miracle. We want to be sure that, that we're not you know, do, doing the very thing that, that we're pointing out as a flaw in the debate. So, Sean, when you use that term miracle, what do you mean by it? Well, I think you know, maybe a simple definition, but we're talking about a supernatural intervention into the natural realm. In other words, God is intervening in the natural realm to accomplish something that no natural process could accomplish. Um, so like putting mud on a man's eyes who's been born blind and suddenly he's able to see. Sure, sure. Or standing up in a boat in the middle of a storm and saying, stop blowing, and the wind stops blowing. <laughs> Um, and, and I do think I do think that sometimes what we have is a demonstration of power or might, and sometimes what we have is a demonstration of authority. And uh, sometimes we have extra guests on our show. That's okay. Yeah, we do. You see a little <laughs> pink bow bobbing up and down back there. So, <laughs> yeah, right, Sean. The the ideas there; those are all reflected in the different words we have for miracles, right? Signs. Mm -hmm wonders, miracle, power, all of those different concepts and ideas are, are reflected in those descriptions that you gave. Yeah, I think that's right. So ultimately, we, we see a divine, a divine cause to every miracle, correct? Right. Now, I think but it's a, some... Go ahead. Sometimes God chooses to work through means other than himself directly. Sure. Sure. Um, so he can use human agency. Sure. Uh, which would be any of the miracles that we see a man performing, right? Right. Moses throwing down, Moses and Aaron throwing down the, the staffs then becoming snakes and picking it back up, right? That's, mm -hmm. there's human agency involved there. Sure. Sure. Um, you've got all the apostles, you know, healing people, first century Christians, laying hands on people and healing them, speaking in tongues. These are all have a divine source, but they're done through human agency. Elijah and Elisha, when, when they raise the, the two little boys, great examples there, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's human agency there, they're, for lack of a better term, they're hands on with the, with the individual that they're raising from the dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, But then, Sean, there are also times where we have miracles occurring uh, that happen without any sort of human agency whatsoever. Yeah, and I think a great example of that are the various miracles that take place surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah, um, You've got the darkness upon the land for three hours. You've got uh, a couple of earthquakes that obviously are, are intentionally caused. Um, you've got mm -hmm. the rending of the veil in the temple. Um, you've got the the resurrection of several dead people after that first earthquake when the tombs are open. Um, these are all things that God did. There's obviously no natural, you know, I guess there could be a natural cause for an earthquake, but, but timing it with the darkness would indicate it was miraculous. Right. Um, you know, it, it wasn't an eclipse. The moon wasn't right for an eclipse. Um, and, you know, certainly dead people don't rise on their own. Uh, something <laughs> has to happen. There's no natural process Indeed. that, that we're aware of um, that would allow that to happen. No, there's direct divine intervention. And God didn't do that through any man. It, you know, it wasn't right. that someone went and laid hands on these dead people. Um, we see you know. a similar principle in the Old Testament, right? When God provided quail and manna for the mm -hmm. Israelites in their wilderness wandering, right? There was no human intervention or agency there. It was just you woke up one morning and bang, covering the ground is this white stuff that, hey, we're going to call it manna. Sure, sure. You know, the flood would fit in with this. Um, yeah. You might think about the way that God showed himself to Elijah uh, when, when Elijah was there in the cave. Um, all yeah. of those were, 
you know, miraculous manifestations, I would suggest, and no human agency involved in that. Or the very creation of the world itself. Mm, absolutely. So uh, we, we see a miracle can occur with human agency. We see a miracle can occur without human agency, simply being the, the product of God himself. So then that's going to bring up a question, Sean. I'm not the only one that has distractions. <laughs> in the office, I see. First Corinthians chapter 13. Mm -hmm. you now this, this is really where this issue centered. All right. So Sean, one of the, the new Testament texts that's very central to this entire discussion about miracles is first Corinthians chapter 13. Sure. So, Let's go over there. I think this is one of the passages that Mr. Neubauer was either referencing or alluding to when he, when he brought forth uh, this line of argumentation in the debate. Uh, I, I think you and I would probably find a, agreement with Mr. Neubauer to some extent that uh, we're no longer seeing the type of miracles described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 occurring in our day and age. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm going to read, Sean, if that's okay, from 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8. Paul writes and says, love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. And so there, there's been questions throughout the years, you know, what is the, the perfect thing or person in verse 10? What is the partial thing or person in verse 10? Um, I think the, the, the conclusion you and I have both reached uh, is the idea there in verse 10 is when God's revelation was fully completed, mm. yeah. then this partial piecemeal format of revealing God's will would be done away with because you wouldn't need it to be revealed any further because it had been fully revealed. Right. And that fits the, the idea of a contrast, because if you look at verse eight, those signs in that, that verse eight have to do with revelation. Um, right. Obviously he's referencing the same list he gave in chapter 12. There chapter are other 12, miracles right. there in chapter 12, but those other miracles confirmed the message is presented through prophecy and, and tongues and knowledge. Um, so categorically, you have the entire list in chapter 12. Um, the, the things specified in verse 8 have to do with revelation. Um, right. To come over to verse 10 and make verse 10 a person. So we now have information contrasted with a person. That doesn't really, doesn't really fit. That's not a logical contrast. Uh, right. So, yeah, we would see there the final revelation. Um, doing away with the need for those gifts. Um, Brother Don McLean, he had a debate that dealt with this passage a lot, and I really liked the, the chart that he put up. It was a, a house with scaffolding around it. And the idea was that the gifts were the scaffolding. They were the, the tools you used to construct the house. But you would never dream of finishing the house and then leaving the scaffolding up. Uh, right. Once it's complete, you, you take all that away. And so that, that seems to be what Paul has under consideration here. Once the revelation is complete, we don't need the tools any longer uh, that allowed us to operate without that complete revelation. So I agree with you, Sean. I think that's the idea that Paul is getting at there. I think Mr. Neubauer takes a different track when it comes to 1 Corinthians 13, though. Mm -hmm. And like, like many things with the realized eschatological position, the idea seems to be that the fullness or completion that is talked about in verse 10 has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, it, it seemed to me that he, he read verse 10 as referring to the person of Christ. Um, he's going to talk about, and we'll play some clips here in a moment, where he'll talk about a face-to-face -face meeting. And when we have this face-to-face -face meeting, the miracles are done away with. And, of course, he says that's in... AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. It's an interesting face-to-face -face meeting since he came in a figurative sense, but nonetheless, that seemed to be the argument. So 
once again, we're seeing this realized eschatological position, and, and indeed it's called that for a reason, seeing the fulfillment of literally all of these New Testament prophecies. This isn't just about the resurrection of the dead. This isn't just about the, the return of Christ. This is even about the working of miracles. All of that was accomplished and fulfilled and finalized at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. As those last two stones are pried apart, all of this comes to pass. Sean, anything else you want to add to that before we move on? No, let's move on. Well, you know, I would okay. say one thing. Like, you gave me an opportunity to talk. I'm not going to be quiet. So uh, hey, I, would, I would point out that I, I don't have a problem with the idea that miracles performed through human agency um, now, I don't know that I would get so specific as to say on a particular day in A.D. 70, but clearly they're, they're fading away the further we get into the first century. Uh, right. Just reading the book of Acts, you'll, you'll notice that uh, the further you get into the book of Acts, the fewer miracles you're going to see, especially after, I don't know, about Acts 15, 16, somewhere in there, you're going to start seeing a decline in the mention of miracles. So it's not that, I'm, that, that we're trying to argue that miracles went on for some extended period of time, right. but I, I don't know that we can put a, a day of the, the specific end of miracles and then use that as an argument against the, the resurrection of the dead um, in, the, in the second coming of the Lord. Right. Acts chapter 8, you find out the means of, of transmission of the ability to work miracles, right? Mm -hmm. The apostles were endowed with that ability to not only work miracles, but then to pass on that ability to work miracles by the laying on of their hands. But when you had hands laid on you by an apostle, while that may have endowed you with the ability to work miracles, you didn't have the ability to pass that on. Acts chapter 8, uh, when he saw that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, mm -hmm. these gifts were imparted. So... Sean, I think it would just stand to reason, and I think uh, I heard a presentation from William Bell, who was one of uh, Mr. Neubauer's close associates, um, who, who I think we're in agreement on this idea that you've got the apostles laying their hands on others. Well, when the last of the apostles would die, and when the last of those upon whom the apostles had laid their hands died, the, the miracles that are being described there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 are done away with. Sure, sure. And, you know, that would also be a difference we would have. Uh, Mr. Neubauer is going to argue that all the books of the Bible, the, the Scripture was completed by A.D. 70. Um, I don't think that to be the case. I think that there are books in the New Testament still being written in the 90s. Um, so that idea that you're going to see some miraculous activity continuing on through the end of the century, uh, you know, maybe maybe for a time in the in the early, early part of the second century. I, you know, when exactly all this stopped, is it's not specified. I don't think you can get it out of 1 Corinthians 13. And that's certainly the passage we would go to to talk about when these things are going to cease. And Sean, I, I think you hit on something there. And this was one thing that I noticed in the debate and in my subsequent studies. There's a lot of absolute dating that is done in the in the full preterist camp yeah and it's not just 80 70 um the the argument of course is that in ad 70 as mr newbauer stated when the last stone was pried from the temple that's when all of this was completed fulfilled took place mm -hmm. but there are other absolute dates that the the full preterist position has to and, and i don't mean this to sound negative but I th it's really the only way i i can think to express it um it, uh, a rather contrived date contrived uh, I, and again i'm not trying to be negative but contrived in the sense that it's not spelled out anywhere in scripture yeah yeah and sean this is where we're going to tie the two together what we began with and what we're talking about now the, the, the full preterist argument is that these miracles ceased in A.D. 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem because there was a 40-year period mm -hmm. where these miracles would be done as a sign 
to the people who were seeing them. Yeah, the, I mean, that's the argument. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting. They, they want to they date that 40 years, but they, they can't date it from the front end. They've got to go to 80, 70 and anchor everything. And then they have to work backwards from there to get to their, to their date um, in order to make this argument work. So let's, let's talk about this for a second, Sean. Where does this 40-year transition period that realized eschatology argues for, where does that 40-year transition period come from? Well, they're, they're tying together the wilderness wandering, the 40 years of the wilderness wandering, with the first 40 years of the church. And the right. argument is that the wilderness wandering is a type of those first four years of the church. Yeah, I mean, yeah, types and shadows. So, so a direct correlation uh, between the two. And that's, <laughs> it was an interesting argument. Um, I don't think it works. Um, yeah. I don't think the passages that they went to say that, at least not in the way that they're describing it. And I think it put them in, in a pretty difficult place. Uh, you know, Mr. Neubauer's argument is just that the wilderness wandering is a type of the first 40 years of the church. He's going to talk to us and tell us the manna is the, in the wilderness represents the miracles, and he's going to make a big deal about that in Joshua. Uh, when the, the manna ceases, he's going to say that's when the miracles cease. That's after 40 years. Uh, so the miracles had to cease in A.D. 70, uh, which is kind of interesting to, to be able to put that fine of a date on the beginning of the church. Uh, exactly, exactly when was the day of Pentecost? Uh, again, you've got to count backwards. You, you'd be hard-pressed, I think, to count forward and nail that down on a specific day for 40 years. Um, and as we noticed just a moment ago in doing this, we didn't really get a clear definition of miracle. I don't want to re retread that ground. Uh, but let me let me play a couple of clips that I think will help us uh, to really to really hear this. So I'm going to start off with uh, this point about the 40 year transition. The 40 year transition is over, and who does Joshua meet? He meets the Lord. Now that's in fact what we say in our eschatology. We believe in a 40 year transition. We believe in this wilderness wandering as a type of what was going to take place between A.D. 30 and A.D. 70. So Tyler, we, we played that one from a sermon that he had preached um, where he talks about this wilderness wandering as a type and that that's our, the eschatology that they're presenting. And one reason we play that clip is it's it's... It was a little hard to find that one succinct statement in the debate itself, but that's the same argument uh, that he made. He argues for this 40-year this transition, and he's going to tell us that, uh, that miracles ceased at the coming of the Lord. So I'll go ahead and play that clip for you right now. The Bible teaches that the miracles, the gifts, would cease at the coming of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you to the end. The Bible teaches 40 years of miracles, last days of Israel, coming of the Lord. And by the way, who does Joshua meet in Joshua chapter 5? He meets a man with an outstretched sword. He says, the place where you stand is holy ground. Take the sandals off your feet. He meets a Christophany. He meets Jesus. All the constituent elements of eschatology. Sins are rolled away. The manna ceases. Miracles come to an end. Meets Jesus, enter into the land. That's what we have in the New Testament. It's the proleptical approach. So, Sean, we, we heard Mr. Neubauer talk there about this idea of this 40-year transition period, right? Mm -hmm. All of the elements of, of eschatology, sins being rolled away, manna ceases, miracles end, the meeting with Jesus, and entering into the promised land. Mm -hmm. that, that was kind of what happened in the Old Testament, and that was a figure of the truer reality that would occur in this time period, this 40-year transition period that ends at AD 70. And so if it ends at AD 70, we've kind of got to back the train up 40 years mm -hmm. to find this period, and yeah. it's going to be in AD 30. So Sean, 
what happens in 8030? Well, I guess that's where they're Let placing... me answer that for you. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, we don't you're know. Right. You're right. I mean, th this is something about which Scripture is silent. Mm -hmm. There's no passage in Scripture. Mr. Neubauer told us he is conservative, good, Bible-believing folk. I'll take him at his word. Mm -hmm. But where is that passage? We're having, if, if we're going to buy into this realized eschatolo eschatological position, we're going to have to to, to come to Acts 2 and in the margins of our Bible, write AD 30. Mm -hmm. Because there's no biblical passage that's going to ascribe, prescribe a specific date for Acts 2 or the birth of Jesus or anything like that to any particular day, week, month, or year. That's a pretty good point. So, we're, it's you know, it's the same thing we noticed last week when we were talking about hermeneutics. You take an idea, you lay it over a passage, and you, you make the passage say what you want it to say. And it's, it's the same principle that they're putting into place here. Uh, they're taking their idea, and now they're laying it over the entire New Testament. And they're saying, listen, this all has to end at AD 70. It has to be 40 years long, so it has to start at AD 30. And yeah. you, you're right. You're not going to find that in the New Testament. And then let's just add this in, you know, Sean, sometimes I, I see my brethren post things on Facebook like, well, I'm, I'm a part of the church that was started in, in AD 32 or AD 33, depending on, you know, whatever flavor you take. I would disagree with that concept as well. Are, are you For suggesting the specific that Christians Greek... post things on Facebook that don't make sense? <laughs> Surely not. I'm saying that <laughs> at times in our, in our vigor to, to demonstrate the, the reality that we are the New Testament church, mm -hmm. that at times we might make statements that while the general idea can be true, mm -hmm. that the specifics in which we speak are not reflected in Scripture. Scripture doesn't anywhere talk about Acts 2 being A.D. 30, A.D. 32, or A.D. 33. Right. I'm not saying that that it might not be an interesting, you know, historical deep dive to try to go back and to get an idea of where these things fall, but the reality is scripture doesn't tell us. No, and even if you go back into those historical resources, you're not going to find consensus. No. It, it, not down not down to a single year, much less a, not a at day. All. So, anyway, Sean, that's that's my two cents on on that I, I have a big problem with this 40 year transition idea because you have to have this sort of artificial mm -hmm. at least from a from a new testament book chapter verse position you have to have an artificial start date right right but sean you talked to us a little bit more about this ad 40 or this 40 year period that ends in ad 70 talk to us a little bit about that what what are you seeing in that sean well, I'm, I'm seeing a problem, especially when we look at how they're getting there, the passages they're using. Uh, Mr. Neubauer really used 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll play a clip in just a moment. Um, what he does here is, is just, well, it's a curious way to read the Bible. I'll just put it that way, a very strange way to deal with the text. Um, this text does not say what he's trying to say it does, and I'll show you in just a second. I, I think he knew that. Uh, he's very careful in, in reading certain verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 because other verses would completely undermine his position. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and play that quote for 14. you. And in Zechariah 14. Yeah, yeah, just like Zechariah 14. Uh, it, you know, it's the same thing we saw in Hosea 6. Um, and, and so we've we seen a pattern? pattern of this. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and play that 1 Corinthians quote there, Tyler. Um, where we see what his argument was in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, first of all, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the worlds are come. All right? He's talking about the wilderness wandering. Every example that Paul cites in 1 Corinthians 10 is from the wilderness wandering. It's a type. 
tupakos, all right? So he says that he reads for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now these things happen to them as an example. Tupacos, he says, uh, it's the word for type. He's right about that. These things happen to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. And his argument is that because of verse 11, the entire wilderness wandering is a, has a type shadow relationship with the church, the first 40 years of the church. And so he mentions, you know, the other, ish, the other examples there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I would hasten to point out that there is nothing here about Joshua, about manna, about them crossing the Jordan River, about them meeting the Lord in Joshua chapter 5. Not one word about any of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But I thought it was really interesting he didn't read verse 6. Because verse 6 has his same word. That word examples is the noun form of the same word used in verse 11. Verse 11 is the adverb form. Same word. But notice what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6 says. Now these things, this wilderness wandering, now these things happened as examples for us, listen, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Paul tells us what we're supposed to learn from the examples he used. And it has nothing to do with miracles, when miracles cease, the first 40 years of the church, A.D. 70, A.D. 30, or any other contrived meaning that we could come up with in this text. His point here is, and, and you know, this is a point he's been making since 1 Corinthians chapter 8, by the way. Don't let your knowledge about Jesus and your knowledge about the idol lead you to be proud because you can fall as well. And anybody ever knew that idols were nothing? It was the children of Israel who saw Egypt destroyed, who walked through the Red Sea on dry land because Jehovah God made it dry who saw the manna, who, who drank from that rock that provided that water, all of those things he mentioned there, and yet what did they do? Well, they became idolaters. Matter of fact, 23,000 of them died in one day because of their idolatry. They knew the idol was nothing. And so it goes on in verse 12, it says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Fall from what? He's not talking about miracles here. He's talking about sinning and being lost because you're consumed with pride, and because of that, you leave yourself open to temptation. He says, don't follow the example that you saw in the wilderness. Instead, be humble, be careful, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, as Peter would go on to say it. Yeah, Sean, I, I think you you do well to point that out. It, it's interesting that we had verse eleven read and not not verse six read in the hearing of the audience. I think I think going back and looking at that, I think you're right. I think there was probably some deliberation in in, in making making that selection of passage to read. And again, it's not what, like we just saw that one time. Uh, we saw that in Zechariah fourteen. Um, we saw that in Hosea chapter six. Uh, we're seeing it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. At some point, you have to wonder, are, are these all accidental? Or does Mr. Neubauer just realize that if he reads these whole context, the verses themselves will, will counter the argument he's making in the passage? Kind of like when you make an inclusio argument about Jesus' statements on the cross. But maybe we'll talk about that some <laughs> next week. All right. Sean, walk, walk me through something real quick. M okay. Mr. Neubauer made an argument there. The manna. The manna fed them for 40 years, mm -hmm. and then the manna ceased. Now, is Mr. Neubauer drawing a, a line of connection between the shadow of manna and what he says is, is he saying that miracles would be the the reality that correspond to the shadow of the manna that that seemed to be what i understood uh throughout the debate um, because he's going to tell us that the ceasing of the manna correlates to the ceasing of the miracles uh, so yeah I, I think he's taking that miraculous feeding of israel 
and he's associating that with the the age of miracles in the New Testament, and and from that telling us there has to be a hard end um, at a, at, a, at exactly forty years. He believes the greatest miracle of all time could happen place any time. So did you get up? Did you looking for the miracle? Sean, that that forty year period really becomes central. And, I, and this is something I didn't realize until uh, the last couple of nights of the debate and then doing this study, you know, doing my study since the debate. Mm -hmm. That 40 year period is the argument concerning miracles. That miracles correspond to the manna and, and that 40 year period of wandering in the wilderness. And that as, as that 40 year period ended, so in the New Testament, when the 40-year period ended in AD 70, that's when the miracles would be done away with. And that has to be the answer because you couldn't have a, a biblical prophecy like 1 Corinthians 13 extending on past AD 70. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Tyler. Um, in their, their doctrine, you cannot have a single miracle performed after AD 70. Uh, which is how they, in my understanding, that, that's how they put a hard in and say there could not be a resurrection of the dead after this point. Uh, you know, we made a distinction a moment ago between direct miracles, God performing a miracle directly, mm -hmm. and God performing a miracle through human agency. And when you go over to 1 Corinthians 13, the miracles that are listed there, the idea there has to do with these miracles of revelation, which were being performed through human agency. I don't believe that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 eliminates the possibility that God could act directly in a miraculous way. Now, I would hasten to say I, I don't have the charismatic view that we should expect a miracle today. Uh, you know, in that sense that just anything miraculous could take place. Um, but, you know, I think we see something different from that, really just reading through the New Testament. Um, it seems to me that when God does act directly in a miraculous way, we almost always have a prophecy telling us that's what's going to happen. You know, I don't think God wanted his direct actions being confused with some sort of extremely strange natural phenomenon like you might see, you know, in the pagan religions. And so when God was going to act directly, he gives us prophecies. You know, we mentioned those things that happened surrounding the cross. All of those fulfill prophecies that we were given in the Old Testament. Right. Uh, we should have known, or they should have known, to be looking for uh, those particular events. And, Sean, I think it's also a worthwhile point to make. You know, we, we had some Pentecostal friends who were watching the debate, and <laughs> yeah. their observation was— the, the kinds of miracles that, that they argue for, they see a distinction between miracles that, that are worked using human agency and miracles that, that are worked solely at, at, the, at the acting of God himself without any sort of human agency. Mm -hmm. And I, Sean, I guess that's where we need to get back to as we start to, you know, bring this back to where we started. The original quote from Mr. Neubauer was about the, the greatest miracle in the world could, could occur at any moment in our lifetimes and, and how that's, you know, a silly thought. And he denies that anything like that could, could ever happen. Well, the reason he denies that Jesus can return from heaven in, in the air and end this world by means of fire and bring the righteous to heaven confine the wicked to hell while raising the dead is because it all occurs after AD 70. Mm -hmm. It all occurs after AD 70. And if it would be a prophecy that extends uh, a miracle after AD 70, it can't happen because AD 70 is the stopping time. Yeah. Here's what I believe. I'm going to lay that over scripture and everything else is going to have to fit that. Uh, if I have to ignore certain verses and emphasize others to, to get that done, then, then that's what I'll have to do. If I have to arbitrarily contrive dates, then that's what I'll have to do. Um, but, but AD 70 is when everything's fulfilled. 
And so I've got to find a way to make Scripture read that way. That, that seems to be the process. I'm not saying anybody thought it through that way, but that seems right. to be the process that's required um, to, to arrive at this AD 70 doctrine. Sean, one, one other thing before, before we finish. I'm thinking back to Mr. Neubauer's ar argument about manna and manna corresponding with miracles. And at the, at the end of the 40 year period, the manna stopped, right? God mm -hmm. fed them for 40 years in the wilderness with manna. When they come into the promised land, that stops. Mm -hmm. But Sean, I don't think the miracle stopped, did they? They didn't seem to. And you know, it's kind of interesting to me. Um, he tells us that the, the 40 years in the wilderness is the 40 years of the church. He then tells us that the ceasing of the man is the ceasing of the miracles. That's at the end of the 40 years. Uh, they're not in the wilderness anymore. That's why the man ceases. So we've got a little, I've got a little question there. When exactly did the 40 years cease? Yeah. And, and you know, wh wherever you want to put that, what I find interesting, if you just took that, that entrance into the land as, as, you know, the coming out of the wilderness entrance into the land is one section, um, what we see is another miracle. And, and what you see there is the walls of Jericho falling uh, through the direct miraculous activity of God. Um, yeah. So if I was going to accept their, their concept, that this is a type of what we see in the church, that's essentially what we're arguing for, is that sometime <laughs> in the first century, uh, men were no longer able to perform miracles. God, however, maintains his power as God, um, and we're looking forward to one more miracle. I, I, don't, I don't know why, why would that be any more of an abuse of the text than what the 8070 doctrine does with that text. And the fact that we're looking for a miracle from God uh, is, is not just some sort of pipe dream. No. Right? This is, this is something that I think you and I, when we read Scripture, we would find God revealing to us in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the very thing that God is promising through the Apostle Paul. Right. So we're not just looking for some random intervention. We're looking for what Peter writes about in 2 Peter chapter 3. Mm -hmm. The day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. Yeah, and, and you know, I understand that our 8070 friends are not going to agree with us on those passages. But this, this miracle argument... It, it's just not helpful. It, At least you have the to assume to be that those passages are, are, are talking about AD 70 rather than talking about some future miracle and then make this point. It, it's, not a, it's not a convincing point mm -hmm. to anyone who's read 1 Corinthians 15 and defines death as death in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's not going to be a convincing point to anyone who's read 2 Peter chapter 3 that sees that the destruction of the world is going to be the same in kind as, as the flood or the creation. Um, to, to tell me that I can't read 1 Corinthians 15, see a resurrection promise there, and then expect God to do it because 1 Corinthians 13 says that the spiritual gifts given to men have ceased is a non sequitur. Unless we're going to limit God and we're going to say that God is no longer able to perform miracles, um, the, the argument just doesn't hold up. And then to, to, to claim that we're going to be people who are of the book, that we're going to follow the book, that the Bible is going to be our sole standard and guide, and yet we're going to start superimposing dates in Scripture and saying that these are the dates you must accept and that this is that when we've got no scriptural evidence to that end, I think that becomes extremely challenging as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sean, are, are we expecting one more miracle? I am. And I have I no too. idea when it's going to happen. It may happen in the next moment. Um, 
but I think we ought to be prepared for it. We're not expecting another miracle by human agency. We're not expecting the, the works of prophecy or tongues or anything like that, that 1 Corinthians 13 references. But we are awaiting one more working of God. We're awaiting the, the day of revelation of Jesus Christ and the destruction and perdition of ungodly men that corresponds to the judgment that occurred, the universal judgment that occurred in the days of Noah. Absolutely. Well, we're, sh- we're not, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, finish, please. <laughs> well, you know, I, to your point, we're not looking for the sick to be healed. Uh, we're, we're not looking for God to, to put an end to war here somehow miraculously. Uh, but we are looking forward to the final revealing of Jesus Christ um, and, and to be seen as he is. That's, that's what we're looking forward to. I think that's a great point. And that's a great place to end our discussion today. Sean, I think the uh, I think the cables and fiber optics between Amarillo and Longview are a little bit slow today. <laughs> oh, but that's, we, that's okay. we have been we have been able to muddle through. Uh, I'm sure some people will say we definitely muddled through, but um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, oh, we have been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so. you know, if we, if we got through it in less than three tries, I'm happy. Uh, that's I for sure. You. And uh, by the way, thank you to our special guest today. Um, uh, I was yeah. I you was... saw a little pink bow bobbing <laughs> around back there. Uh, Daddy's on daycare duty today, <laughs> and so uh, you may have got uh, brief brief pictures of of my little girl back there, and uh, she's been a, a trooper today. And we're about to go get. Some lunch at Raisin Cane's Chicken Fingers, who should be a sponsor of this program. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, I may do the same thing. Hmm. Cane's, we're talking to you. <laughs> but seriously, thank, thank, thank you to all of you who have joined us for our study today. If you have any questions, reach out to, to me or Sean, and Lord willing, we will be back with you next week for another study and hopefully sean i think we're about to wrap up our examination of the reeves newbauer discussion so yeah i think we're getting we're about to draw that to a close and then we'll we'll move on to some other bible topics looking forward to it all right sean have a great day you too man take it easy bye-bye bye